Hello and welcome to episode 23 of your monthly Leader Breeder podcast with myself and your host, Aiden Jeffrey. Leader Breeder podcast is a leadership podcast dedicated to helping you discover and develop your leadership voice in order to deliver greater value in your life, career, ministry and business. In this month's episode, we're going to have a look at the introduction to our new series starting next week on the Leader Breeder platform and the podcast for eight to ten weeks. We'll see how that goes titled The Nehemiah Effect, the leadership series on how to build your organization from rubble to a running success. Hey, listen, super excited about what the Lord has dropped into my spirit about the Nehemiah Effect. Looking at the book of Nehemiah, leadership secrets, leadership traits, leadership lessons on how to build your organization from rubble as Nehemiah did rebuild the walls in Jerusalem to a running success. We all want to run our organizations, our careers, our ministries, our churches as successes. And I want to have a look at over the next few weeks, sharing with you a few thoughts about our process we recently went through. We opened our new building in Cape Town uh, on the 10th of March. We started on the 8th or the 10th of uh, January in renovating and restoring a building the Lord opened up for us in Cape Town and a two and a half thousand seater right here in Cape Town. And uh, went through a whole lot of, you know, uh, exciting times two months 60 days and so the lord pressed on my spirit about nehemiah who rebuilt the walls in 52 days now when we started when i started the the process the f- furthest thing from my mind was nehemiah and 52 days in rebuilding the walls but as we've completed this to the glory of god over the last while the lord just really reminded me and said to me you know it's a similar thing you went through the pressure the timelines the deadlines um, what you had to go through in order to get that project you know, from concept to completion, from rubble to a running success. And I want to share a few thoughts, a few lessons that I've been reminded of again, new lessons I learned about how we went through this process. But I want to have a look at particularly referring to the book of Nehemiah and what he went through in 52 days to take something that, you know, maybe some people thought was impossible or maybe even he thought was impossible in the beginning. And how do we implement this into our day or our life uh, right now? You might be a business owner, entrepreneur, might be in the corporate sector, might be going through a bit of a slump or a dip in your business, whatever it might be, your ministry. I want to take this next few weeks and really unpack a few leadership thoughts on how you can take your organization from rubble to a running success. We all want to make a success of our lives, which is it doesn't go without saying. But really, I want to ask you to invest yourself in this series. It's going to be super exciting. A whole lot of, you know, um, really key lessons we're going to go through, episodes we're going to go through, unlocking a whole lot of leadership traits. And uh, I'll be sharing a few thoughts on our process as well and how we managed to pull off, you know, something that looked impossible in the start uh, in 60 days and how Nehemiah pulled off something in 52 days. So come on, get ready for this brand new series we're starting right now. The Nehemiah Effect, you know, how to leadership keys or leadership lessons on uh, how to build your organization from rubble to a running success. Can't wait to be with you in this month's episode. I'll see you on the other side of this. Well, episode 23, we've been uh, away for two months. Can you believe it? Uh, Didn't uh, do an episode in February and in March simply because of the reason that we were busy with the Nehemiah effect. We were busy uh, working uh, long hours every day. And I want to share a few thoughts around this process, our Cape Town building we opened up. We, uh, I'll tell you the story in a moment, but uh, just a few thoughts around the Nehemiah effect. I, I, I've entitled it the Nehemiah effect because, like I said in the introduction, the furthest thing from my mind was um, you know, doing a series after the building on Nehemiah But the Lord really just pressed on my spirit uh, the last few weeks about, took us 60 days, I think it's 59 days to be exact, from when we started, when the contractors and myself and the contractors arrived on the building site, up until when we had our first service on the 10th of of March. And um, again, I just, you know, we did it, we were in the press and we did our thing and we got the building opened and it's been an incredible process. And so the Holy Spirit just really pressed on my spirit to look at the life of Nehemiah and the 52 days he went through. We did 59 days. And like I said, it wasn't a plan to do a Nehemiah comparison. But I want to take us on a journey over the next few weeks. And if you are a young businessman or a uh, you know a more mature businessman, whatever it might be, this series is going to really 
encourage you, help you. If you're a pastor, if you're a leader in any shape, form or size, some keys, some lessons might jump out at you, refreshes, reminders of uh, the leadership responsibilities we have and how to take something from rubble, in our case, a building that was, you know, a previous uh, uh, organization and it was in a total mess when we took it, basically rubble, and we had to turn it into a running success. How we have church every Sunday. We've now, Good Friday has just passed recently and we had our highest attendance since we've been in the building and, uh, you know, close to 2,000 people we had in our service with children and it's really just exciting to see what, um, you know, God has been doing in that building. But to take, when I think back to the process of if I started out the day we walked in there and, you know, what was before us and where we are now, I be, must be honest with you, I think if I knew what I was going to go through in those 59 or 60 days, not too sure if I would have just, you know, sort of walked into that thing uh, as not as, as blindly as we did, but as as not knowing what was lying ahead. And so a few of the things we're going to have a look at over the next few weeks is going to be things like, you know, leadership keys of vision and purpose and planning and strategy, uh, team building, speaking about effective communication when we are to communicate clearly in this process, um, resilience and perseverance, uh, problem solving and decision making. A lot of that had to happen all the time, daily planning before, after, empowerment and delegation, not doing everything yourself, adaptability and flexibility. Hey, listen, we have to be very flexible. I told the staff, uh, you know, volunteers, leaders, we have to be flexible in this process because it's going to be a press, a push, and we have to, you know, change the way in which uh, we are. We were doing things before, the inconvenience sometimes of what, um, you know, we were used to and uh, the press we went into over that time. Things like applying pressure to specific tasks and having a deadline to launch date because without a deadline, you know, everything is just a dream. A goal without a deadline is simply just a dream. So we got so in this introduction episode to our series that we're going to be following over the next few weeks, I want to look at focusing this episode on vision and purpose. You know, I often say to people that uh, announcing something or, um, you know, starting something is the easy part. It's to sustain something that's the hard part. And that's why I think it goes without saying that, you know, the Bible's very clear, without vision, my people perish. And so when you look at uh, the Nehemiah effect or your business effect, or how do you take something from rubble to um, a running success? How do we to go from resilience to tenacity to, you know, um, uh, patience and stickability without vision and purpose, this things, everything you do in life is always going to fall short in some shape, form or size. Now, in Nehemiah chapter one, the Bible says, and they said to me, the survivors who are left from the captivity in the province are there in greater stress and reproach. And the wall of Jerusalem is also broken down and its gates are burned with fire. So the Bible says, and so it was when I heard this verse four, um, that I sat down and wept and mourned for many days. So we see this information, this news, this um, it comes to Nehemiah. He's in Babylon and he's not even in Jerusalem, but he, he's a Jew. And he gets to hear about the fact that the um, city that he obviously grew up in, that he knew the nation that uh, was uh, his, his birthplace was broken down. The people were in distress and the province was in a, in a mess. The walls were broken down. The economy was standing still. And the Bible says that it was burned with fire. And so this man just gets this picture and suddenly he mourns and he weeps in his case. And obviously the Lord does a work in his heart and he starts to um, see, you know, is there, not a, is there not a reason that I can do something? I mean, King David, when he went to uh, give his brothers lunch in the story of David and Goliath, we know the story. And uh, when he, he sees this Philistine, you know, throwing verbal abuses at the whole uh, trained army of uh, Israeli soldiers, and they're all too afraid to tackle this one man. And David's cry simply to his brothers is, is there not a cause? And they were so taken aback that this young 17-year-old had the guts to face this, you know, this massive big giant of a man. But the reason that David was able to, you know, boldly declare um, that he was willing to take on this Goliath or this giant or this vision of bringing this Goliath down was because there was a cause, a reason for doing something. And that's what I want to say to you as well. You know, so often we want to live lives of success. Well, not often. We, we all want to live lives of success and significance. But without a vision, without a purpose, without a reason for doing something, it's either going to fizzle out into, 
you know, um, sort of nothingness over a period of time, lose interest, or else when the first persecution comes, the first challenge, the first battle comes, then we'll tend to either make excuse or walk away or, you know, start to say things like, well, you know, I wasn't really, um, you know, that this or the economy this or Goliath was too big for me or, but when you have a vision, a, a purpose, a cause that's greater than you, well, I can tell you, when when we were in the press of the 60 days or 59 days of the Cape Town building project, I can tell you there were days when I uh, thought to myself, gee, this is, this is much harder uh, in this timeline that I gave myself, you know, two months or the 10th of March was the date that we chose to to open the service. And there were some days, to be honest with you, when I thought to myself, this is nuts, man. You know, are we, uh, I mean, to put ourselves under all this pressure and to, you know, um, really we could have just maybe taken this over three months or six months, but I didn't have that privilege at the time because I had to be out of my other facilities by the 31st of March and I needed to give myself a week or two, you know, to exit those buildings. And so, the date I chose was the 10th of March, and that immediately gave me a deadline and a pressure line to say I have to complete by that time. But I can tell you, if it wasn't for the vision in front of me, the vision of building CRC or advancing the kingdom of God, the vision of wanting to consolidate the two churches, the vision of speaking to the people and saying we're going over there, we're going to restore, or in Nehemiah's case, we're going to rebuild. And that's what I want to say to you as well. You know, without vision... Bible says in Proverbs 29, 18, without vision, my people perish. The message translation says it so well. They say if you know, the people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves. And that's what happens when you start to get into the press or the pressure or the pushback or the resistance or the resilience. You'll hear over the next few episodes as well about Sanballat and Tobiah, how they try to speak Nehemiah out of um, the project, I had some people even approach me, try to speak me out of the project, try to stop us from doing the work. Why? Because the vision wasn't in their heart. And I say to you as well, without vision and purpose, you are always going to um, quit in some shape, form or size. But because the vision drove us, because the, the cause ahead of us drove us, it gives you the tenacity, the gift of faith, the ability to push through and to continue. And that's my encouragement in this opening or introduction episode to the series that's going to follow over the weeks ahead without a vision my question to you then is what is your vision what is your vision board what do you see for yourself what do you see for your life you know every time jesus came to um, someone in scripture and he wanted to heal them he said what do you want me to do for you so what do you want that's your vision um i want money okay he has five rand or five dollars I need a lot more than that. Well, that's what you told me. You said you want money. You say, well, I want to. There always has to be a purpose or a, a vision, not just money. Money follows. Money is one of the benefits of having a vision. But what is your vision? As we launch out into this new series, let me ask you the open and honest question. What is your vision? What do you see for your life, your future, when it comes to your, your faith, your vision for God, your vision for God's kingdom, the church? What is your vision for your finances? What do you, where do you see yourself five years, 10 years, you know, 20 years from now? What do you see for your family? What do you see for your fitness? Your, your, all these areas we can have a look at, but what is your ultimate vision? What do you want? What do you want from God? What do you want from life? What do you want for yourself? And you, if you can't answer that in one or two clear sentences, you have to have a clear vision and a purpose. Nehemiah had a clear vision and a purpose to rebuild this wall. His vision was, my people are in distress and they are struggling and they are in reproach. They've been uh, annihilated by an enemy. And I have a witness in my spirit to go and rebuild and protect that city, rebuild it. The vision came to him clearly. And once he was fully persuaded on the vision in his heart, nothing was going to stop him. And I want to say to you, if something is able to stop you from doing what you know, um, you initially started out to do is because perhaps the vision maybe wasn't clear enough or perhaps the purpose wasn't clear enough. And that doesn't mean to say the vision that you have is wrong or you're going to fail. But then I would say make your vision, make finding your vision, your vision. Make it clear. Bible says to Habakkuk chapter 2, you know, write the vision down and make it plain. Make it clear. So what is your vision? If you look at us as a move of CRC, our vision is very clear to build one church in many locations. Our mission, our mandate, our mission is to mend the nets, 
to make sure that those that get saved, we can work with them and get them involved in the local church. But our mandate is what? Is to win the loss at any cost. Our vision is clear. As a move of CRC, when Postad birthed CRC in 1994, our mission, our mandate hasn't changed. It is still altar calls on Sundays. Uh, our Passover weekend pass has just finished recently, and we've had huge altar calls in all our churches across the country over the last while. Why? Because our vision remains clear. Our vision remains um, steadfast. Our purpose hasn't changed to win the loss at any cost. We do church a certain way. At the conclusion of all of our church services, we do altar calls. We invite people to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior, and we offer people a place to go to the altar and pray that prayer and to receive Christ into their heart. Now, some people have issues with it. Some churches say, we'd never do that. Well, the reason is because your purpose and your mission and your vision isn't the same as ours. Whatever yours is, you do you and we'll do us. And does it take? Does it come with criticism? Of course. Does it come with opinions? Of course. Does it come with pushback and negativity? Of course. But are people being saved? Of course. Why? Because the vision is clear. So what is the vision that you have for your own life? What is the vision? You might be listening to this today and saying, I don't know. Well, like I said it earlier, then make finding a vision your vision. Then, you know, seek, knock, and ask. Uh, what is the passion that drives your heart? What is the... The, the creativity that drives your 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 intelligence or intellect or your imagination what is the what do you see that other people don't see because you see things that I don't see and I see things that you don't see and that's called you know, your vision and your vision must be clear and I would encourage you if you haven't written down your vision then write down your vision make it plain and then we start to formulate we start to put you know a uh, uh, meat around that those bones or meat around that uh, the, the the flesh and the sinew we start to build this thing over time and you know Jesus when it came to Jesus life at one point he wrestled with his father in the garden of Gethsemane just before he was going to be crucified and his wrestle was he knew I mean it wasn't like Jesus had never seen a crucifixion before I mean Rome they would torture people all the time in Jesus time he was he would often walk by you know, people that were crucified. Because for the Romans to put fear into people, they would crucify people on a daily basis, on a weekly basis. All over Rome, you know, crucifixes were, you know, strewn all over the city, and all over the streets. And so Jesus himself, you know, he wasn't, it wasn't something that he hadn't, didn't know. So the fact that he knew what the agony, the pain, the torment, the, the screaming that people would go through, he knew. But to be crucified was not going to be a simple little, you know, case of ras or all. Let's just whatever will be will be. No, it was an intense, um, you know, uh, excruciating, painful process that he had to go through. But because he had a vision and he knew what he was sent for, he, he, throughout Scripture, Jesus would say, you know, for this purpose I have been sent. And in the in in the in the Garden of Gethsemane, because he knew what his purpose was, because he knew why he had been sent. He cries out in, uh, in, in Gethsemane to his father and he says, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Now let me tell you, in our process of 60 days of you know, uh, building the, 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 the church in Cape Town, there were times when I thought, Lord, if it be your will, let this cup just pass from me. Let somebody else just take this over or let this thing just disappear or let just you know, ma wave a magic wand and suddenly this whole thing is finished and I don't have to go through this press and this frustration and... Um, all this, you know, all this, the, the, the pressure cooker environment. And that's what happens whenever you have a vision that is um, going to affect nations, that's going to rebuild countries or rebuild walls, rebuild families, rebuild broken things into whole things. That's what happens when, when you have a vision. And that's why you have to make sure that you are fully persuaded in your vision. So what is your vision? Jesus was fully persuaded. And so he cried out, let this cup pass from me, but if it be your will. However, he said, not my will be done, but thy will be done. He knew that he was there to fulfill the purpose of his father who sent him. So because his vision was clear and his purpose and his mission and his mandate was clear, Jesus was able to push through the, the times of you know, possible doubt, the times of possible the quit. Uh, you know, I want to throw in the towel. I want to stop the business. It's hard. Or making the excuses. And like I said to you, what is your vision? 
as we launch out into the series, we're going to drill into these things in more detail. But my question to you in this episode, this introduction episode for the series that lies ahead, what is your vision and what do you want? What do you really want in life? What do you want? I'm going to say that again. What do you want? Not what does your mother want? What does your father want? What does your husband, your wife, your friend, what does the government want? What do you want? If you had to be truly honest with yourself, if money wasn't in the equation right now, if money wasn't the issue or the limitation possibly, what would you want with your life? Something that is worthwhile, something that's going to you know, affect the lives of other people. It can't just be, I want to be a rich person or I want to make a lot of money. I mean, like I said, if you want to make a lot of money, you can play the lottery or you can you know, gamble on horses or you can do whatever. You can you know, sell floor polish or you can... Um, whatever money money can be made in many ways but that doesn't mean to say it's going to be you know a passion of yours it's going to be um, you know enjoyable sustaining for you it's going to be something you can do over a long period of time uh, because you enjoy it you know somebody once said i'm not sure exactly what the the phrase is right now My, you know, quote me if i'm wrong or correct me if i'm wrong but it's something like you know if you if you love your work or if you if you love what you do you'll never have to work a day in your life Something like that, where if you love what you do, you'll never have to work a day because your work is going to be just your passion. It's like I, I actually I I I I I will I want to wake up in the morning and go do that thing. And I must be honest with you, um, what not a lot of people might know about me, but I worked for my father for three or four years in the building industry, and he had a steel business. And when he had a heart attack, he had a four-way bypass years ago, and. I went into his business and I saw exactly the same as Nehemiah. I saw that the my dad's business was you know broken down and um, it was in ruins and and the staff were in in um, distress and reproach because he was in hospital, and so I decided I was going to leave my job, and resign my job and go and help my father, and that took me into a three or four year process of learning in the building industry and things like that, and I learned a lot. And I must say it wasn't a pleasant season because it was hard, difficult trying to you know, help my father's business recover and rebuild that. But when it came to this project now in Cape Town, it's something that I have a passion for, restoring things. I love you know, renovation videos online. I love creativity. I love building things. And that's where I am gifted. I love um, in that channel. I, I, I love taking things and restoring things and, and building things and creating things. So for me, this was a sweet spot of mine. The challenge of of taking a building that is broken and and making it whole, you know, something that's barren and making it fruitful. It's my sweet spot. And so because it was a passion of mine, it wasn't e- it wasn't difficult for me to wake up in the morning and go back to the building site and what's the exciting challenge for today. But if it wasn't a vision that we were certain of and it wasn't a, a plan that we've been, you know, meditating on or, or trying to, um, you know, to find land, suitable place for four years, I most likely would have quit when it got harder. But because it was a, a vision and because it was clear and because it was a passion of mine, uh, it actually fueled me. I actually got more energized. I actually, when people were getting tired around me, I was becoming more energized because that's what your passion does. That's what your your vision does. And although Jesus was going to go through excruciating pain on the cross and be crucified and you know agonizingly have to give up his spirit and die for our sins, yet the fact that he had a purpose and a passion and a mission, you know, the Bible said it was for joy that was set before him, that he endured the cross. So it wasn't as if it was fun, but because he knew what he was sent to do, he knew what he wanted from the start, what he had to achieve, he was able to endure, he was able to continue. And for this purpose, he said, I have been sent. So for what purpose do you want to go and do something out there in the marketplace what's the reason what's your ultimate motive for wanting to do what you want to do and i want to say to you it can't just be money it can't just be i want to be rich because like i said you can be rich in many ways but you can still be unfulfilled you might you know like i say win the lottery and have 50 million x in the bank but if you're still not fulfilled in waking up in the morning and living out your passion your god-given creativity you know, you are going to fizzle out and eventually it'll lead you down paths of destruction with a lot of money, but being unhappy or miserable. And so my question to us, like I said, in the launch of the series, what is your vision? What is your purpose? What is it that is the compelling vision that inspires and motivates you to want to go towards that, that, that goal that you've set before you? What is that, 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 that vision? And I want to say it again. 
What do you want? What do you really want in life? Because until you can't be fully persuaded, Paul the Apostle said, I'm fully persuaded. Until you're not fully persuaded with regards to what it is that you, um, you know, on this earth for. And that's hard for many people to answer. Now, I don't say you're going to, you know, find that, that, that answer very quickly and go, well, you know, uh, I discovered what I was meant to be on this earth at the age of nine or seven or three, and I did that for the rest of my life. For many people, they're still, you know, wrestling with themselves at 35 and 40 and 50 and 60 and 70. People are wondering what they were supposed to do with their whole life. And, you know, I say to you as well, what is that thing that you gravitate to on social media? What is that thing if you gravitate to on on, on um, Google? If we were to go to your top 100 searches or your top 100 websites you visited in the last, you know, sort of year, if we were to go to the, the top 100 videos you've watched. Now, again, it might be, sport related videos or whatever i don't say you must take up that sport but there's always a a thread there's always a common thread your heart what the heart is full of comes out the mouth what the heart is full of where your treasure is there your heart is and so your treasure your heart will always go to something and look for what that is what is that thing and then see if you can take that thing that your heart gravitates towards that it moves towards and could you turn that into a business venture you know, could you take that thing and could you, is there a place for it in the economy that could either be um, birthed into a new business or could it be um, an existing thing that might be in the marketplace that you could also, you know, take a share of that market that you could actually do? Is it ministry? Um, is it, is it, is it, you know, are you called to, to be part of a church or are you called to plant your own church? I mean, I have so many people wrestle, you know, I'm called to be a senior pastor of a church. Okay. Do you know that to be a senior pastor of a church is very complex? There are 50, 60, 70 things that are happening simultaneously in any ministry. And I'm just, that could be more. But I'm saying there's many things that run simultaneously. And if you are unable to, you know, visualize that or conceptualize that or holistically see those things and get them all to move um, at different speeds but in the same direction, you most likely are going to struggle to be the senior pastor of a church. Uh, many people look at their bosses and they look at their, um, their, 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 their places where they work and they see somebody drive a big car and it looks like that person, you know, I'm the person doing all the work and they're driving the big car. No. Before you were able to even be employed in that company, earn a salary, that person had a vision. They worked hard. What are you doing now? They did all the hard yards and now they're able to, because of their gifting, their skill, their vision, their purpose, their grace, their talent, they're now able to stand in that place and 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 manage uh, many facets of that business of which your your department is one. And now you look and you say, well, if I I can do what they can do, and I've seen many many people step out because they think that because somebody else has a vision and they're fully persuaded in that vision, and sometimes we're frustrated in our channel um, of our lives and we step out and it becomes very difficult when we suddenly realize, wow. I feel very exposed where I am right now. Now, on the flip side, I also want to say that sometimes people step out and they're just, you know, young in their, in their process and they've got to learn and they're called to be there, but they've just got to gain new information. So it's, I'm not saying everybody who, who steps out is going to fail. What I'm saying is that if you don't have a vision, a passion, a reason for wanting to do something greater than just money, you know, like I said, in Nehemiah's case, it was the city was broken down, the people of captivity, his, his nation was on in ruins look at guys like that movie um schindler's list when the Jew, the jews were being persecuted in the holocaust and he you know had a vision to save you know people innocent people from the clutches of of the german nazis and he was smuggling people out of the country and got the hundreds of thousands i'm not sure exactly what the numbers are but if you've watched the movie you know, he became a hero, but the vision was to save those people from the distress and the reproach of the Nazis. And in Nehemiah's case, it was to rebuild the walls and restore dignity to a nation. So, you know, what is your vision? Is it just, you know, what is what is compelling about your vision? What is what is what is there about your vision that is going to employ people, help people, give people dignity, um, restore, uh, you know, recover? 
um, establish, build, uh, create? What you know? What is it that's going to add value to human society? That's going to add value to life? That's going to fulfill you? That's going to make you want to get up in the morning and continue doing that thing over and over and over again? And that doesn't seem like work is actually fun for you, hard at times, but fun for you. And I want to encourage it in this episode, this launching episode, the Nehemiah effect, you know, leadership keys on taking something from rubble to a running success. And you're not going to get past the rubble stage uh, until such time as you have a clear vision, because when it does get tough, when it does get hard, you have to look back and say, why am I doing what I'm doing? You know, the opening service for us, <coughs> second service, excuse me, <coughs> our, uh, um, I was in the, in the uh, well, uh, yeah, after our first service on, on the 10th of March, I got into to bed that night and uh, I was really just, really, it was, I was physically very, very tired over the last 60 days. I was really, and I was so grateful because we, you know, we did so well and the church and I'll, I'll talk about all these, the, the, the staff, the leaders, the volunteers, I'll speak about you know, everyone's process and part in this in this journey over the next few episodes, um, launching every Tuesday from next week. But one of the things that, um, you know, I, I, I got into bed that night and I was just reflecting on, I was so grateful. I said, Lord, I'm so grateful for what happened today and I'm thankful for the great crowd. We had a big turnout, almost 3,000 people for the day, morning and evening service and a lot of people saved. And, you know, as I got into the bed, I wanted to put up a post and just a gratitude post and I realized that I'd never really put out a photograph of what the building looked like, um, you know, um, in, the, in the process. I, I only posted photos on that day, basically on the opening Sunday, and it was full of people. And then I, I was scrolling through my phone, and I saw a few photographs of what that building looked like the day we walked in. And it was like I thought, wow. And I went, gee, what a major transformation. What a major renovation, restoration. You know, we changed that thing completely. And as I was busy posting this this post as if the spirit of god said to me he said aiden look at what you did to this piece of brick and mortar you took something that was broken and you made it whole you took something that was barren and you made it fruitful and he said if you can do that if you can take broken things and make it whole and you can take barren things and make it fruitful in 60 days he said what do you think i can do with living stones these this is these are these are this is brick and mortar but what can i do with living stones and he said make this building of yours a house of restoration where you can take people that are broken people from society that don't know their true christ identity and let them come sit in the four walls the confines or online of this building and they will discover their true identity they'll be broken and become whole under the gospel preaching of jesus christ they'll be barren they'll become fruitful through hearing the word of god and through applying god's word in their life and suddenly it's as if the lord just gave me this peace in my heart and said this house will be known as a house of restoration because you restored something that was broken and you made it all now i say this again to say that 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 vision that god put in my heart now i go tell the staff i tell the leaders i've told the church several times i'm telling you on this podcast today that for me that drives us now the the satisfaction the the drive the desire in our children's church to see broken children become whole to see impoverished children to to get hope in the gospel to experience love to 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 be restored back to their true identity who god created them to be life and circumstances have knocked them down but through the the the, the hearing of the gospel in the buildings of, in this case of the four walls of cape town uh, i'm believing that many many people will start to be restored. It's a house of restoration. Now that vision compels me, it drives me to go to church on Sunday and to preach and to reach out to people outside the four walls, welcome people in every week. And that's what I want to say to you. What vision drives you? What thing excites you? What 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 are you busy with every day that you go, what I'm doing is changing lives, not just changing my bank balance, but it's changing lives. That is a compelling vision. And I want to say to you, what is that thing that drives you? What is it? Not just, well, I need money, so I'm going to do this. Or I need money, so I'm going to do that. As I said to you again and again, we all need money. But money is an attribute. Money is a, is, a, is a benefit of having a compelling vision, clear vision, a purpose. And for this purpose, you have been called. 
Paul the Apostle writes in Romans 8, 28, he says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to His purpose. So there it is. There's that word purpose. And so all things, you can go through difficult times. We went through very difficult, tough times, disappointing times, you know, frustrating days in the 60 days. And I'm going to show you in the weeks that lie ahead how Nehemiah went through many, many you know, uh, distressing days, negative days, people trying to stop him, people trying to criticize him, people bad mouthing him, people rejecting him, people uh, just, you know, many things went wrong in that 52 day window of Nehemiah. But because he had a compelling vision, because he was fully persuaded, because he saw the distress and the reproach of the people. And, and in my case, in Cape Town now, we have a vision at CRC, it's very clear. But what made this process of mine even more clear was the Lord said, let this building, when they hear the gospel, when they to win those lost people, let, let this be a house of restoration. My prayer right now, every week is, Father, thank you for another Sunday that you'll bring people to the house in Cape Town and they will be restored to their two true Christ identity. Let them discover truly who they are in you when they hear the gospel message, when they hear the good news, when they stand in the presence of God in worship, when they join a home cell, when they find community, when they find fellowship in the church. May they, may they, may broken parts of their life be whole. May, may barren parts become fruitful. And that's what I want to say to you. Get a compelling vision from the Lord. Don't just be, you know, out there nonchalant, you know, well, I'll just see what happens today. No. What do you want? What is the thing that drives your passion? What is the zeal? What do you what do you love seeing changed? What do you love seeing created? What do you love seeing being brought from death to life? What is that thing? What is it? It could be, you know, don't have to own your own thing. You don't have to be a senior pastor or own your own business. What is it in your career? What is it in the place where you work, where you have a, a passion to see Whatever it is, you know, uh, I, I don't want to um, sort of limit it to one area today, but I want to say to you, what do you want? What do you want with your life? Don't allow the hurts and the pains and the, the disappointments of yesterday to limit you. Don't let the words of people limit you. Don't let your failures of the past limit you. You are called of God. You have a fingerprint. You have a unique calling on this planet. You are needed. You are loved by God. You are alive for such a time as this. However, you're not going to live a life that is very fulfilling or very compelling as long as you don't know what you want. Not what your parents want or what the government wants or what uh, you know, everyone else wants, but what do you want? And once you know that, the Lord will attach the right people to you. The Lord will attach the right you know, life partners to you. The Lord will attach um, you know, the right associations to you. Uh, doors will open up, even though those doors at times might seem like they're going to close. But if God opens up a door, no man can shut it. But you need to be fully persuaded, even if it looks like it's going downhill or it looks like it's not going to be completed or it looks like you're going to miss that, that, that launch date of the 10th of March in our case or it looks like, you know, everybody's conversation. Uh, I had conversations with people and they told me X, so I'll, I'll share with that in the weeks ahead. Not negative, but just it's their viewpoint, it's their perspective, and their perspective is not mine. And so people sometimes can have a, a vision at you or a sight of you, but the vision is from within you looking forward, and they're looking back at you. Now they want to give you an opinion of what they think you should be doing, but they weren't there when the Lord showed Nehemiah the, the reproach and the distress of the people and how he mourned and wept for days and how his heart just really knitted to the project. And then God said, okay. It's now time, you, I'm going to call you. And then God gives him a witness and then bam, and off he goes. And now it's a matter of saying, I'm fully persuaded. And now in the weeks that lie ahead, we're going to talk about the planning, the strategy, the team building, the communication, the resilience, the perseverance, the, the problem solving, the decision making, the empowerment, the delegation, the systems. We're going to have a look at how do you take something that's just a good idea or a thought or a desire or a dream from rubble and we turn it into a running success where there is income, where there is sustainability, where there is, uh, you know, staff compliments, where there is a satisfied customer base, where people's lives are being impacted and changed. And this is the key to, to, to understanding the Nehemiah effect. And obviously, um, you know, we're going to look at that in the weeks ahead. So, hey, come on. Just a little bit of introduction this week. Uh, I want to encourage your, your faith, encourage your, your, your journey um, you're not listening to this back, so I know we've had a two-month delay because we were delayed because of the, the rebuilding of the walls of our building in Cape Town, and we are now 
uh, running and we are up and running and we're still finishing a few uh, you know, small things around the building and we'll continue to work on that over the weeks and months that lie ahead. But we're operational. We are now a running success. And I say that because we are successful. We are called to be successful. Even though sometimes you know, life comes against you, you are called to be a success because I've come that you might have life and life in abundance. So come on, child of God. Come on, businessman. Come on. You are a born again, spirit filled, a wonderful child of God. And God is going to use your life for continued the glory of His name. Don't ever cancel yourself. Don't write yourself off. Don't sell yourself short. You lift your head. You pull your shoulders back. You are called of God. And we know that all things work together for good for those that love the Lord. So get ready for the next few weeks. And if you've got something out of this episode, share it with someone. Go into our leaderbreederworld.com website. Go into our Leader Breeder uh, social media pages. Follow uh, for updates of when the next episodes will come out. Subscribe to Spotify, you know, uh, iTunes, all the different podcast platforms, uh, our YouTube uh, uh, platform as well, Leader Breeder. And um, invest in yourself. Share this with somebody. It's free. And I'm excited to see what the Lord is going to deposit into your heart, into your mind over the next few weeks as we together on this journey of discovering and developing our leadership voices. So have an amazing, amazing um, week further, amazing, amazing month. Share this episode with whoever you feel needs to hear it. And can't wait to be with you in our next series, our new series, the, the Nehemiah Effect, our leadership series. How to turn your organization from rubble into a running success. Be blessed and can't wait to be with you soon. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining us here at Leader Breeder. Make sure to subscribe to the channel to catch the next episode every month.